one Russian atheist astronomer came over here to America, and he was speaking at the university, and he said, folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, wow, now that's a brilliant conclusion to come to. <laughs> but then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I thought, wow, now that is a brilliant statement. See, if there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. If there really was a God, you wouldn't have to find out who he is. If he wanted us to know that, we would. All of us, everywhere in the world. There wouldn't be thousands of denominations within violently conflicting religions, all of them obviously making up whatever mythology they wanted to fantasize. And unbelievers, like myself, wouldn't be the fastest growing and already third largest demographic with regard to religion. The American founding father, Thomas Paine, observed that the Persian shows the Zenda Avesta of Zoroaster, lawgiver of Persia, and calls it the divine law. The Brahmin shows the Shaster, revealed, he says, by God to Brahma and given to him out of a cloud. The Jew shows what he calls the law of Moses, given, he says, by God on the Mount Sinai. The Christian shows a collection of books and epistles written by nobody knows who and called the New Testament. And the Mahometan shows the Quran, given, he says, by God to Muhammad. Each of these calls itself revealed religion and the only true word of God. And this the followers of each profess to believe from the habit of education, and each believes the others are imposed upon. If there really was a God, a single uber-cosmic deity who created everything, that it already has everything, literally, so it wouldn't want anything more. If it did want something, we would be unable to provide it. It can't be that God wants us to love him, because if that was the case, then it wouldn't be that we would have to make believe that he was there. We wouldn't have to take it on faith, because he'd be like any responsible parent. If he loved us, he would show us all clearly that he really was there. So there would be no question about that. No being worthy of worship would ever want to be worshipped. Only narcissists want that, to conceal their troubling insecurity. God would, of course, be above that sort of thing. It would not be like the petty, insecure, tyrannical despot that the Bible makes him out to be. Religious people seem to love narcissists, as if it doesn't matter how wrong you are, just as long as you sound confident. But God wouldn't be like that, because he wouldn't have a malignant personality disorder requiring that he impress or intimidate anyone. The notion of hell, however, implies a petty deity with a desperate need to impress someone. But if there really was a God, then there still wouldn't be a hell, because God wouldn't judge people over what or whether they believe. That wouldn't matter. And if it did, then God would show us all the same truth unambiguously. So Christians wouldn't go to Muslim hell, and Muslims wouldn't go to Christian hell. All those who threaten damnation for anyone who believes differently than they do should imagine meeting God themselves and finding out that all the religions were wrong, that this one Eastern tradition was closest to the truth, but that it doesn't matter what you were misled to believe because it would be a terrible injustice to punish someone over belief. No just God would allow damnation. Commanding merciless torture for eternity is obviously the very opposite of infinite mercy. Well, why don't people who read the Quran understand that? And no deity capable of miracles would need people to do its work, nor could we do its work. Think about your job, what you do for a living. Now imagine telling a classroom full of kindergarten children to do your job for you. You'd waste more time, effort, and energy teaching them to do it than if you just did it yourself. And God doesn't bother to teach us anything, like he certainly would if he was really, you know, real. Imaginary beings need you to do their work for them because they can't do anything for themselves. And usually when you pretend to do your God's work, when you do what you say your God wants you to do, it's really just an excuse for doing what you already wanted to do anyway. Most religions insist that their gods want us to believe in them, but that's really the people in and behind the various religions who want us to believe in order to restrict information and control public opinion, to give reverence, deference, wealth, and power to the clergy. 
They invented or appropriated this mythology so that they could take 10% of everyone's income and pay nothing in taxes while they also manipulate, oppress, and abuse the masses and illegally control the way their congregations vote in order to keep themselves in power. As with any unquestioned authority, abuse of power follows. Like with the church pedophile scandals, it's covered up until the pressure from outside gets too great. If there really was a God, then that wouldn't be the problem that it has always been in every religion. If there really was a God, and there was something that it still wanted or wanted us to do, we would all know what that is. We wouldn't have to choose from a library of supposedly holy scriptures which book was right, when logically none of them should be. Even if there really was a God, all those books would still have been written by mere fallible men who obviously had no idea what they were talking about. That's why the scriptures of every major religion are full of absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions. None of them even can be the absolute truth, but they can be absolutely wrong, all of them. And they still would be. Even if there was a God, evolution would still be an inescapable fact of population genetics, fossils, and phylogeny, while the Bible, the Quran, the Adi Granth of the Sikhs, the Avestas of Zarathustra, and all of the other supposedly sacred scriptures would still be man-made mythology with no truth in them. None of them are infallible. None of them are true. None of them are actually the word of God. And none of them would say what they do if they were the word of God. And look at all the time wasted in the scriptures demanding that you kill the unbelievers, but not a word to teach us about chemistry or microbial pathogens or anything else that a caring parent would want us to know. Instead, every supposedly sacred scripture tells fantastic fables of magic spells and talking animals and a whole lot of things that we know for certain never really happened. And even if there was a God, we can't know what it said because all we have is the empty speculation of people who can't agree on who or what God is much less what he allegedly revealed during some drug-induced fever dream. Because God doesn't really say anything. He doesn't speak for himself. If he did, we wouldn't need ancient stories or prophets to speak for him. He'd still be talking to us today. And he would speak to all people instead of giving conflicting messages to different prophets that contradict what he allegedly told every other prophet. And the vast majority of prophecies ultimately fail anyway. Every prophecy in the Bible that has an expiration date already has failed. Every religion proposes that we discover the so-called truth of whichever gods or ghosts or telepathic aliens by praying to them. And the problem with that is that it actually works, regardless whether the thing you think you're talking to is real or not. If you talk to any imaginary being long enough, whether it's your spiritual guide or animal totem or ancestral spirits or whatever it is, if you convince yourself that it's listening, eventually you'll be convinced that it's talking back to you too especially in situations of significant emotional stress. Just remember, the bloody volleyball can't really hear or understand you. And you don't really hear it either. Its voice is coming from inside your head. So if there is no God, or there is and it doesn't care about us, then there is no way to find out who God is, or what he wants, or what he said. Not without following the fables of men as if they were the word of God. Every denomination thinks they know better than everyone else, but no one really knows whether God ever said anything, much less what he might have said, though many pretend and some just hallucinate. Remember also that a lot of folks have murdered people, sometimes even their own children, because they thought their God told him to do so. So it's actually better if you don't do whatever you think your God says. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Yes, it is a bit scary, and that's why we have to take responsibility. But I notice that religion doesn't do that. Christianity in particular seems to be all about shirking responsibility. It doesn't matter how much we overpopulate or destroy the planet, because Jesus is coming back any day now to roast everything anyway. And Christianity allows that you don't actually have to help anyone either. You just pray for them or say you're going to, which is effectively the same thing as wishing upon a star that they'll get the help that they need somehow, as if by magic. You're just pretending to do something helpful when you've really done nothing at all. And some kids die that way because their idiot parents decide to pray to their magic imaginary friend instead of actually doing something like they really should have. You don't have to atone for anything you've done wrong either. If Josh Duggar buggers little children, his attempted defense is that Jesus has forgiven him. 
Because, of course, your personal God hates everything that you hate, and he understands exactly why you did whatever you did, because he is you. So he'll always accept your bullshit excuses. Even if you get the death penalty, that'll get you out of prison and with your God, who understands fully why you did whatever you did, and maybe you even think that he told you to do it. Funny that religious people are statistically far more likely to endorse the death penalty than atheists, even though Christians know that it doesn't work for them. So as a Christian, you don't have to take care of each other like Jesus said. You don't have to take care of the environment either or anything else because you can just pretend that your magical spirit in the sky will sort all that out somehow. And that way you won't be responsible for anything, ever, not even for whatever crimes you commit. Even uh, one famous scientist said, this evolution transformationism is a fairy tale for adults. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. This preacher says one famous scientist, but he's actually quoting two, or rather misquoting two, both from way back in the 1950s, and neither quote implies what the preacher wants it to. <laughs> what a surprise, right? Uh, having not one actual fact in favor of his fantasy, all the preacher can do is quote mine scientists. And the first one listed here, Jean Rostrand, an atheist from the French Academy of Sciences, says that transformism may be considered as accepted and no scientist, no philosopher, no longer discusses, meaning questions, the fact of evolution. And the other quote from Professor Bonheur is even wronger. And Bonheur was a Christian. He never said evolution was useless, but he didn't like discussions about evolutionary principles, so he complained that by this, evolutionism would appear as a theory without value, as confirmed also pragmatically. A theory must not be required to be true, said Mr. H. Poincaré, more or less, it must be required to be usable. Indeed, none of the progress made by biology depends even slightly on a theory. The principles of which, i.e., how evolution occurs, ED, are nevertheless filling every year volumes of books, periodicals, and congresses with their discussions and their disagreements. He's making the same wrong argument as the preacher. He doesn't want anyone to work out these undirected processes and mechanisms because he'd rather just think that everything was divinely guided. Even if evolution theory is true, it's useless. It's of no value to science whatsoever. On the contrary, in 2008, the National Academy of Sciences publicly stated that evolution successfully explains the diversity of life on Earth and has been confirmed repeatedly through observation and experiment in a broad spectrum of scientific disciplines. Evolutionary science provides the foundation for modern biology, and it has opened the door to entirely new types of medical, agricultural, and environmental research, and has led to the development of technologies that can help prevent and combat disease. So evolution is far from useless. It's quite valuable, practical, and beneficial. We literally depend on it. Evolution is a kind of dogma which its own priests no longer believe, but which they uphold for the people. The preacher's sources are also old. This quote is from 1937, from a guy who was born while Darwin was still alive. It is believed to be another complaint over some you know, then not well understood principles of evolution, though we can't be sure of that since it seems that the original document no longer exists. I couldn't find much more than just the comment that it is suspected that this quote is taken out of context by creationists as Lemoyne was addressing how evolution occurred, not the fact of evolution itself. Even most scientists don't believe in this, but they're afraid of losing their job or their research grant money, or they're afraid of peer pressure. No different than a fifth grader afraid what the other fifth graders think of them. Understand that the only way to get rich and famous in science is to challenge the status quo. So scientists really don't care what the other scientists think. Now, creationists have been repeating this nonsense for more than a century, that scientists are supposedly abandoning evolution. But like everything else the believers pretend, the opposite is true and always has been. First of all, atheism is more common among scientists than the common public. And one poll reports that scientists tend as a group to be less religious than the general population. About 64% of the respondents describe themselves as atheists or agnostics, as against only 6% of the general public. Looked at the other way around, only about 9% of scientists say that they have no doubt that God exists, compared to well over 60% of the general public. In fact, you don't even have to be a scientist. Statistically, the more educated you are, the less likely you are to still believe in a god. 
Remember that the only education this preacher has is a bachelor's degree in religious instruction from a theological seminary. Yet he calls himself a doctor, touting a bogus mail order degree, and he portrays himself as if he has some sort of competence or authority in science. In 1987, Newsweek reported that, by one count, there are some 700 scientists with respectable academic credentials out of a total of 480,000 U.S. Earth and Life scientists who give credence to creation science. This was based on a list of signatures of scientists who allegedly doubted Darwinism. That list was provided by the Discovery Institute, an intelligent design propaganda factory dedicated to undermining science education. The implication, as Newsweek saw it, was that the total number of collective geologists and biologists in any specialty who still believe in supernatural creationism over evolution, via natural selection, is only 0.14%, barely more than one-tenth of 1%. One so if 99.44% equals pure, as it does in the silver trade, then evolution is accepted by the entire global scientific community. Yet, Preacher says that the majority of scientists don't accept evolution, despite the fact that every poll and all available data says otherwise? Abraham Lincoln believed, as I do too, in an established maxim in morals, that he who makes an assertion without knowing whether it is true or false is guilty of falsehood, and the accidental truth of the assertion does not justify or excuse him. Now remember that religion is all about pretending to know things you don't know. And notice that the preacher never cites any studies or polls to support any of his wild and baseless assertions, because there aren't any. So how can he honestly say these things? He can't honestly say that. Instead, he is just... What is the word for... What do you call it when you claim something to be true, but you have no indication that it is, and all the facts actually contradict that, but you say it anyway because you want to fool people into believing you? What is the word for that? for what this preacher always does every day.